So again, this is me. I announced to the world, hey world, I'm using this formula with this generator point to arrive at this final point. If you can tell me what this lowercase private key is that I used to get there, then I will give you a thousand Harriet Tubman dollars. So now that you know the challenge, you get to work. Just like the previous multiplication example, we begin with the generator point by adding it to itself. Again, this is actually two points resulting in the tangent line with the curve. Now, that's one point, that's two points. There's obviously a third point, which is denoted as negative 2g. From there, just like in the previous example, we reflect it over the x-axis, giving us a point of 2g. Now, if we apply this to our trapdoor function, we have g as an x and y coordinate. We have the private key of 2 because we multiplied the generator point by 2 to arrive at our final public key point of 2g. Right? Makes sense? Now, again, we this is a competition. You are trying to find what is the private key that arrives at this final point, at this final public key. I told you that this is my public key, and I asked you what private key did I use to get there. Now, if you used 2 as the private key, you get this point right so this is your public key you could easily compare and say well clearly two is not the correct answer because this is not the final point that you are looking for so now what now you check to see if three is the private key since we know two is not in other words does three times g give you that final k we're looking for or is g added to itself three times that final public key point we're looking for. So the process is the same. We'll add 2g to itself to give us the tangent point, resulting in that third intersection point of negative 3g, which is then reflected over the x-axis to land on our final point of 3g. So just like previous, we compare it. Is 3g our final point is it our public key clearly no so what do we do now check to see if four is the private key so we add 3g to itself to give us the tangent line resulting in the third point of negative 4g reflect that over the x-axis which gives us the actual point of 4g Again, we check. We know that 2G isn't it. We know that 3G is not it. And now we know that 4 is clearly not the private key that I used. So you try it again. You add 4G to itself to get the tangent line that results in the third intersection point of negative 5G, which is then reflected over the X axis to give us the point 5G. So looking here, we might have something. And in actuality, 5G is actually X and Y points. And so is my final point, X and Y. So it's not really that you would be just looking at the curve and eyeballing it to say, hey, is that point the same point? Is it close? Um, no, the, the formula will actually return X and Y coordinates, and that's what you would really compare. In this case, you got a match. Five is the right private key. So I would then give you the money and say congratulations for being an elliptic curve expert. You won the competition. You accurately told me what private key I used without me having to tell you what the private key was. So as you now see, it's impossible to be given the coordinates of both of these points and easily arrive at the answer for lowercase private key k integer. 
Your software would have to begin with the same G point and perform an extensive brute force search using the same curve to repeatedly add G to itself and add G to itself and add G to itself repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly until it arrived at the final point. It's called brute force search. In our example, where you just won the money, you performed a brute force search five times to arrive at the final point. Now, obviously, a computer would be able to easily perform five brute force searches to arrive at the final point in our example. But a trapdoor function relies on brute force searches being feasibly impossible in technology's current state. So a private key using a small number like four or five wouldn't be satisfactory in the least bit. However, Bitcoin's private keys are 256 bits. Hence the 256 in SCCP 256K1. The number you see here is an example of a 256 bit number used for a private key. I inserted the necessary commas here to give you a better idea of how insanely incomprehensibly huge of a number this is. So just imagine how many slides, images, curves, and reflecting operations it would have taken if we added G to itself as many times as that previous super large number. It's virtually impossible even for computers to reverse engineer that. So what does all of this mean? Your public key is exactly that. It's public. When you send Bitcoin to somebody or sell it using an exchange, the transaction gets submitted to the blockchain for approval, along with your public key, which allows the public to verify that you are the owner of the corresponding private key without the sender ever revealing his or her secret private key. Therefore, if somebody wants to determine your private key from the publicly available public key, his or her software would have to solve for the trapdoor function over and over and over and over, 78 possible digits worth of a number to compute the proper private key. Remember our competition that I was just talking about? How it only took you four brute searches to figure out the private key I used? Well, again, imagine if I used a 78 digit number and you had to brute force search a 78 digit number to figure out the private key I used. It's virtually impossible. So let's recap. Using a 256-bit private key as the secret element in an elliptic curve trapdoor function produces an extremely high level of security. It also produces a public key that is feasibly impossible to reverse engineer in the form of X and Y coordinates that satisfy the formula or parameters of the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. The public key and private key are mathematically linked. The public key is the direct result of the private key used. If the private key changes for any reason, the public key will be different. This mathematical link remains constant forever and cannot be changed or broken. All of this comes together in a form of asymmetric cryptography that empowers the private key and public key cryptography behind Bitcoin's decentralized blockchain. If you can understand all of the videos up to this point, you will understand the basics of advanced cryptography, the advanced cryptography that empowers Bitcoin's blockchain. But be sure to continue with the rest of the videos because there's still a lot more to cover, such as the digital signature aspect of ECDSA, Bitcoin addresses, and the whole mining process.